Hi, Michael. Great. Hi, Sujana. Uh, you were telling me about, you know, Lacan, so maybe you can expand on that. All right. So it seems to me that Lacan is the last famous psychoanalyst, the last one who really made a big impact. And it also seems to me that he is the although he didn't write about it, appears to be the only person in the mainstream canon who had an accurate explanation of psychosis. And I'm not entirely sure he has an ac accurate explanation of all psychosis, but I'm pretty confident that it is an accurate explanation of all of the interesting psychosis. Okay, and I'm finding that my phone is low on power, so I'm going to have to move a little, try to plug it in, all having this call. But, um, let's not worry too much about that. Um, of the, so we mentioned Hegel, and I guess the, thinking about Lacan a little bit more. Um, so, thank you. So, like, I got interested in psychometrics a long, long time ago. Like back before I started my first company, I had been, th mm. the very first company I started was called SnapJ 15 years ago. And mm -hmm. SnapJ was for, for Snap Judgment. And I'm sure the URL would be worth something now if I still own this. And mm -hmm. I started it with two Harvard business grads, one of whom had started the company already both of whom had business experience and it was an ultra despair, pathetic failure. We set up shop in a um, Florida suburb and one of my co-founders was so obsessed with like healthy diet that he would spend maybe five hours a day between talking about preparing, researching and eating like a incredibly elaborate, mostly raw diet and mm -hmm. almost nothing Almost nothing got done in that life, but um, I had hoped to do something. The business model, by the way, has been tried a few times since then, and it doesn't seem to have ever taken off, so it doesn't seem to ultimately be a viable business model, which is kind of a shame. But the idea is that you should have a version of Hot or Not that isn't just about being hot, but about what impression you're making, where you can like submit what adjectives describe you, you know, professional, uh, determined, you know, and get feedback on how this compares you to other people. And that seems like it's very useful from a interviewing perspective, et cetera. And anyway, I got interested in it because I had been paying attention to like the Myers-Briggs personality model, which many scientists claim is non-scientific and the five-factor personality model which is actually non-scientific. It's just the absolute height of scientism. And one of the things that I had become aware of is that the Eisnick personality model, which has three dimensions or four, including Floyd G, was much more scientifically rigorous in terms of st good statistical practices than the Myers-Briggs or the Big Five. And I had been aware that there were no different places where the Isaac model was used with slightly different names in it. But I didn't be become aware at the time that Lacan was using those terms, that he had a three-dimensional personality model. And like one of the Isaac terms is inverted, as one might expect from a model fo focused on inversion. So instead of extroversion, neuroticism, and psychoticism, Lacan has perversion, neuroticism, and psychoticism but it is the same model visibly, except that Eisnick is doing a dimensional, dimensional analysis and Lacan is doing a classification, a, a categorization scheme. And so that, that was really strong evidence that he was looking at a real thing. Whether you're looking at classifiers or uh, dimensions is always going to be a matter of statistical preferences and you know exactly what you're trying to do. But um, are you there? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so I was interested in the fact that Lacan seemed to be tracking the right dimensions and his writing is impenetrable, but the, he seems to be the foundation for Slavoj Žižek, who's somewhat less impenetrable. 
And there's a internet encyclopedia of philosophy that does a very good job at breaking down people's stuff. And in Lacan's case, there's also a, a hypertext called No Subject. No Subject is the name of the hypertext. Yes. That actually explains his views. And if you actually like go through his views and have the type of non-conceptually constrained thought that he is referring to, and you look at the in hypertext, you ought to be able to figure out what he's talking about. Although the names of the concepts are extremely deceptively labeled. Mm -hmm. So I guess the most straightforward example of a de deceptively labeled concept in Lacanian thought is imaginary, by which he means produces an image. He doesn't mean that the image is not real. In fact, all things that produce images are, in Lacanian jargon, imaginary. So the, the, your image on the other end of this cell, cell phone conversation and also the images of the you know, lights and fan, et cetera, in my room, these are all imaginary in Lacanian psychological jargon, not meaning that they don't correspond to something real, but of course, like all things, they don't correspond to ultimate reality. But the primary thing that he's pointing at is that they don't correspond to the symbolic order, the drivers of political and power decisions of people with class privilege. And I feel like when you, another deceptive term in Lacan is language, where he makes a distinction between language and codes, and where codes involve unambiguous one-to-one -one mappings between one thing and a a referent and a symbol. And language involves equivocal, not merely ambiguous, but equivocal mappings. So mappings that are that preserve the ability to deny what you said. Mm -hmm. So his psychology is basically or organized around power games that are basically organized around um, maintaining the ability, maintaining social norms that privilege the violation of commitments in some circumstances. Norms such as limited liability, which we have in corporations, as a very overt American example. Mm -hmm. So, language. by the way, um, I created a triad uh, for psychoanalysis, where I put Freud, uh, so imagine a triangle, right? So I put Freud here, and I said that it has biological basis so that would uh, that's something that i would call empirical psychology then i put carl jung on the other hand here and i called it psychical basis because he had a very collective view of psychoanalysis and then i put jack lacan here with the semantic basis and i call it semantic psychoanalysis so i feel like you know this entire concept of psychoanalysis kind of and like the biggest and the main thinkers of course uh, you know different from the object relational school is this particular triad. And Freud being here is because, you know, how Lacan would say that uh, it's a return to Freud and that he is basically interpreting Freud in a, in a more cohesive manner. Um, and so wh what do you think about um, the Freudian concepts in relation so to So I Lacan? think that Freud knew that Freud did not know what was going on in, psych in psychosis. And okay. I think Lacan knew that he did know what was going on in psychosis and chose not to tell. It's important to note that normal psychoanalysts don't treat psychotic patients. They only treat hysterical and neurotic patients. And Lacan did treat psychotic patients, but he didn't write about how he treated his psychotic patients. And That's um, what? That's very true. That's very true. Yeah, so I'm pretty sure that he didn't do so because that would be more subversive than the already highly subversive thing that he was doing. Mm -hmm. So I am personally pretty strongly disposed to think of Freud's success as powered by the usual generator of hype, which is that when someone reveals information that people are highly motivated to keep secret, they face increasingly strong opposition. And then they face, 
and the greater the degree to which they've been threatening, the greater the degree of support they get when they start to conceal that information again, providing an alternative cover story. So I'm not the person to invent the idea that many of Freud's patients from whom he generalized the concept of an Oedipus complex were actually being sexually abused. But like, th th this is an old idea that like Freud in discovered that if you listen to people carefully and empathetically, many of them will tell you that they've been sexually abused. What Freud did that made him super successful is in response to social pushback he got when talking about how so many of his patients were being sexually abused, he proposed this alternative concept, the Oedipus complex, which is the idea that people are just crazy. They're not really being sexually abused. They're just making it up because they have a perverse desire to be sexually abused. And Lacan is a return to Freud in the sense that he's a return to making use of the ambient social forces committed to concealing widespread sexual abuse and committed to rewarding those who could but don't try to reveal it. Mm -hmm. so, I would say that he is more of a developer of Freud, right? Because, uh, so here's the thing. Uh, a lot of postmodern thinkers uh, are kind of accustomed to this thing called obscure rantism, which is basically making a text so difficult that it's incomprehensible. So you can count Hegel, Heidegger, Derrida, Lacan. Um, so what do you think about this obscure rantism kind of uh, phenomenon? Okay, so I think that, okay, there is a lot of value in the idea that things should be explained as if to one's grandmother or as if to a teenager. There's a lot of value in the idea that if an explanation is hard to understand or is only accessible to a, an erudite audience, this implies that the explanation is to some degree dishonest and to some degree sloppy. Mm -hmm. There is also some truth to the idea that power is, in general, wielded through deception. The word power in Sanskrit eventually changed its meaning from power to illusion. And eventually people started to say that everything was illusion. So there is a natural process whereby methods of, of control other than illusion, get driven out by methods of control of illusions. And eventually, even acknowledging material reality gets driven out. And you end up with um, the entirety of the narratized world being the play of shadow on shadow. So um, anytime people are doing something obscurantist, one can fairly say that they are not being perfectly virtuous and perfectly brave and perfectly articulate. But like, it's really harsh to object too strongly to people not being perfectly virtuous, brave and articulate. Mm -hmm. um, and also, even if people are pretty damn close to perfectly virtuous, brave and articulate, if they are trying to talk about things which people don't want talked about, a, the claim will be made that, that what they're saying is incomprehensible. It will be claimed that what they're saying is obscurantist or inarticulate. And B, people will claim that they're saying all sorts of things that are like incredibly thin, incredibly unlikely interpretations of what they're saying. So like... As a practical matter, I guess I'm thinking about Rand and Marx. Both of them are like very angry. And 
it's pretty clear that the ways in which their work has been misused are greatly empowered by their anger. Their obvious anger makes them vulnerable to being to their makes their works vulnerable to being abused in all sorts of ways. But it's hard to say that it. I'm not ready to say that. Mm-hmm. Uh, insofar as anger has no legitimate purpose, who are we to second guess nature on that? Insofar as anger has a legitimate purpose, the sorts of things that Rand and Marx are angry about seem like they are very, very close to the center of that legitimate purpose. So the word virtue itself means manliness and might legitimately be suspected of lacking a certain universality, just as the word bad itself means femininity. And this might be held against the English language rather than being held against femininity. Um, So, there's a, what do I think about obscurantism? I think that it's probably very bad for most minds to develop in an obscurantist environment. If someone isn't learning computer science and David Hume before they learn Kant and Marx, they are never going to learn to use their minds in the way that could generate Kant's or Marx works. They're going to only use, learn to use their minds in the ways that could be used by Kant or Marx. Mm-hmm. Um, so we were briefly talking about equivocation in Lacan and you brought up Freud as empirical. And Back to the very beginning of philosophy, there's this dichotomy between empiricism and rationalism. I think this is like the eminent dichotomy. And that is an obscurantist dichotomy in that while empiricists make claims about what they mean, their claims are insufficient to narrow, to pin down what they mean. And while rationalists make claims about what they mean, their claims are obvious lies. Rationalists claim to mean that the senses are entirely delusional, that the senses are entirely misleading, that we can't learn through experience. No one has ever believed this. So most non-obscurantists, most honest thinkers have called themselves empiricists, but most non-obscurantist thinkers are not tracking the fact that pretty consistently when there are debates between people who say that they're empiricists and people who say that they're rationalists, the people who say that they're empiricists are not embracing the type of empiricism that someone like David Hume or Aristotle are justifying. The sorts of empiricists who call themselves empiricists and who are not famous philosophers are like business people who are basically endorsing being controlled by the market, being conditioned, being controlled by other people's uh, mental postures and interpreting the world, not through their own eyes at all, but through someone else's eyes. Mm -hmm. So um, when I've thought about it though, I basically concluded that rationalism and empiricism, although there is a lot of Obscurantism going on, the actual difference between rationalism and empiricism is this simple. If I lend if I lend you 10 bucks, a rationalist will say that someday you have to pay me back that 10 bucks. And if I lend you 10 bucks, an empiricist will say, someday I have to lend you another 10 bucks. <laughs> no, that's a good one. So It is specifically debt out of all of the things in the world that is canonically anti-inductive. It is specifically debt where to observe X 
predicts minus x in the future, if and only if accounts are being settled, debts are being pay paid, etc. Mm -hmm. So the entire real world of obscurantist philosophy is the world of living in a social si situation where people coordinate to prevent the repayment of debts and also to prevent the creation of common knowledge that the repayment of debts is being created, separating people into the high brow who do not repay their debt, the middle brow who do not know that debts cannot be, re uh, cannot be collected, and the low brow who have not come into a position to extend credit. I'm going to ask you another question, by the way, because this question is asked by almost every philosopher, psychologist, neuroscientist, and computational people. What do you think about consciousness and consciousness versus panpsychism? Um, where, where do you start? I would that? say, I would say, that words have to mean either the thing that the word is usually used to mean or the thing about the world that caused the word to be invented. Mm -hmm. And every word is equivocal between how the word is usually used, what is called the ordinary language use of that word, and a pointer at reality, at, at some regularity in reality that would cause people to want to invent the word, which is sometimes called the ostensible definition. Mm -hmm. So, consciousness in the ostensible def definition means a claim by the those who are calling themselves conscious to be entitled to extract value from without consideration those who they are claiming not to be conscious. So when I say that my company practices conscious capitalism, what I'm saying is that my company is entitled to break its commitments to companies that are not practicing conscious capitalism. And that it, my, I'm saying that the customers of my company are more conscious than their parents, and therefore they are entitled to break their commitments to their parents, basically. Like in the ordinary language use of the word, consciousness is means members of a political coalition that may maintain some sorts of standards and norms for behavior among themselves, but are ready to endorse breaking those commitments and norms against others. Just like I wouldn't feel like I need to uh, pay a tree for its wood after chopping it down because the tree is not conscious, even though there is a great deal of information processing that goes on in the tree. The tree, in fact, is tracking the presence of different pests and the location of the sun and the severity of the, you know, cold snaps and the availability of water. The tree knows many things, including things that I don't know, but I nonetheless don't feel like the tree is conscious. I don't feel like I ought to pay the tree back for its wood. That, that's the ordinary language use of consciousness. Yeah. The ostensible definition of consciousness, the fact about the world that causes words like consciousness to exist, is that there's a... Well, I'm saying something right now that there's a, sometimes I might say I'm conscious of a glass of wine in front of me. And for me to say that some percepts have to gel into a classification of like some sensory input and some symbol needs to be advanced and some like some symbol needs to be promoted and some data seems to be recorded about that symbol having been detected or being ac activated at that point. And that recording of that data 
allows me then to like talk about that recording. That information flows from that data being recorded into my speech. So in that sense, consciousness actually just means memory. Or more specifically, it means the type of memory, the type of episodic memory that is memory of the sequential activation of symbols as part of a causal narrative. Mm -hmm. You know, Freud so, like, also... that's not mysterious. Oh, sorry, uh, go on. Oh, sorry, I cut you off there. You can complete your thought and then I can... Uh... I was saying, there is no hard... There, there isn't a hard problem of consciousness in that sense. There is no... Nothing mysterious about memory needing to be recorded and memory needing to be stored of symbols being activated and interpreted as part of a you know, sequential narrative. There's nothing mysterious about that in principle, but there's a lot that's mysterious about it in practice. We don't actually understand how the hippocampus works nearly as well as we understand how the cortex works. We don't actually understand the rules by which we interpret causation and narrative all that well. So like there's a lot of technical details to fill in about what we mean by consciousness. But like in the ostensible sense of the word consciousness, I don't feel a lot of ambiguity about whether say animals are conscious. I feel like really confident that a raccoon is conscious <laughs> and like really confident that a frog isn't conscious in terms of the ostensible definition. I'm not gonna have an exact line, but uh, you know, but the question is one of, does this brain transform its sense data into symbols and its symbols into compressed like sequences of explanation within its hippocampus that it can, you know, use, bring out to organize its actions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what I was saying about Freud is that, you know, within his interpretation of dreams, uh, he talks about how our dreams are essentially um, a makeup of your short-term memory and your long-term memory. So, you know, when you were talking about consciousness, as, you know, being memory, it kind of reminded me of that. Um, so what do you think of uh, what is happening within dreams? Is dreams just, you know, as Freud would say, a, a compilation of, episodic memory and your long-term memory, or is there something more going on? So I feel like there has been some reasonably good research into dreams in the time since Freud happened, so that we know some things that are kind of interesting. Like I think that we know that if you do certain types of tasks that tend to create strong dreams of the task, like playing Tetris, you tend to to dream about that task for exactly four days after that task. And I have heard people claim that four seems to be a magic number for drug addiction as well. That if someone wants to explore, say, heroin, they can be like pretty confident that they won't become permanently addicted if they only try it three times. But if they try it four times, they may find themselves permanently addicted. <laughs> you know, so um, there seems to be some type of some type of processing that requires a certain number of repetitions of something to convert things from probably cortical weights on symbols to the creation of new symbols. Almost for sure that's what's going on, is you're creating new symbols out of, out of cortical weightings on old symbols. Um, but I wouldn't have said that two minutes ago. So when I say almost for sure, I mean like 10% for odds, because I'm just making up a psychological fact off the cuff and being excited. So <laughs> like, um, okay, so, so dual end back. Are you familiar with dual end back? There's a type of memory training that seems to make use of the what we know about the need for repetition 
of data in order to form a long-term experience, long-term memories. I think this will probably be type of long-term memories that dreams are producing that involve like the creation of new symbols out of parameter weddings from old symbols. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess that's, um, I don't know, do you have anything more to say about that in terms of Freud and dreams? Yeah, I think I think he I think he because in the 1900s when he you know came up with interpretation of dreams he used a lot of biological basis to kind of you know uh, you know put emphasis on whatever he was creating. Uh, but uh, now with you know further studies in dreams and also you know how Jung also kind of made his own ideas about dreams, uh, you know with the emphasis of collective unconscious that he uh, coined. Um, I think it, it, it is. Uh, it is kind of a combination of your short-term and long-term memory, but there's a lot happening there. Um, you know, uh, I'm not sure whether you know about this thing called hypnagogia and hypnopompia. Uh, these states, uh, these liminal states of consciousness, it's like when you're about to go to bed and when you're falling asleep, there's a 30-minute uh, you know, state when you're trying to fall asleep. And within that, you pe uh, many people tend to see geometric hallucinations, uh, Tetris effects and stuff like that, uh, and you know, explore you know consciousness like that. Um, and then hypnopompia is when you wake up and you have the same thing going on. Um, and so that also kind of connects to you know what is happening in dreams I exactly. So you know, one of the things that I've been thinking about for a very long time is that when we look at the subjective reports of uh, many people going through hypnagogia, most of them you know tend to say that they see uh, the same kind of geometrical patterns. So imagine like a star of David ascending in, you know, ascending in shapes or just like lattice patterns. Um, and, the, and these Tetris effects are basically a short-term memory flashes, uh, image flashes. Um, and then when you finally go into the dream world, you're kind of unconscious. So it's like a, a shift from the, your subconscious state to your unconscious state. And within that unconscious state, you know, all these short-term mem memory and long-term memory become uh, a fantastical, uh, you know, kind of a story. And then when you wake up, you realize the, the dreaming state. So, you know, I, I personally think if we, if we could do an experiment where we put uh, subjects who are, you know, you know, go through a lot of hypnagogic experiences in an fMRI machine and see exactly what kind of brain activity is going on, uh, and, you know, compare it with, let's say, you take 100 participants or like maybe less and see if, you know, these geometrical hallucinations are uh, the same across all subjective minds. Then maybe, you know, these, uh, you know, geometric hallucinations might say much more about objectivity within subjectivity, you know, objective hallucinations within subjective minds. And maybe that could say more about the world itself, you know, because Aristotle was like, you know, everything is uh, geometric, everything is geometric that's the way the world is so maybe these are the objective symbols of the world so you know that that could be happening so that's something so there's very... an organization there's an organization called qualia research institute that has some inquiry that, along the lines that i think you're pointing at you might want to google that oh yeah um, no, i would love to okay yeah qualia research institute is like an interesting example of the sort of highly ambitious revolutionary science that you know you can be almost certain won't lead to anything but almost certain that nothing will lead to anything without people being at least that ambitious and at least that speculative many many times you know like it's it's really um important that we support things that you know are honest attempts to go out into the void and, you know, work on a inadequate, you know, framework and like hopefully get somewhere. Like we haven't been doing early enough of that for the last half century. Mm -hmm. What do you think about qualia, by the way? Like this subjective experience of consciousness? Because, you know, there's a- like, I would say it just as the same thing as, con I would say the same thing about it as consciousness that you have, um, uh, you know, sequential-ish activations of concepts that are tied into like causal structures, like Judea Pearl would tie things into causal structures. And um, 
when we report on those things, like Claudia is like what it means for that to be reported on. You mm -hmm. know, like it's the same concept, whether you call it being or meaning or reference or qualia or consciousness or existence or even neg entropy. It's all just, you know, mutual information in the Shannon entropy sense uh, between uh, some organized, like remembered set of relations and a chaotic world out there. Right, mm -hmm. You know, Edmund Husserl um, and Merleau Ponty and Sartre, uh, and also Heidegger. So I would say Heidegger was more of analytical phenomenology. Um, you know, Edmund Husserl is more expository phenomenological school. And then we have Sartre, who was, you know, with intentionality. And, um, you know, all of these people. Wait, I thought Husserl had intentionality. He had some sort of intentionality, but his main thing was phenomenological reduction in terms of perception. Um, and intentionality okay. was more like, so of course he drew, Sartre drew in from, uh, you know, Husserl a lot. Uh, and also from, from Heidegger. So from Heidegger, he got this ontic ontological. Uh, and from Husserl, he took the phenomenological reduction and actually rejected it. And, you know, furthermore expanded on intentionality. So, you know, they kind of concocted this theory that there's an external physical world out there, which is inac inaccessible to us. Um, and so therefore, whatever we experience as, you know, qualia subjective beings is essentially either a hallucination, you know, as, you know, this neuroscientist uh, Anil Seth would say, you know, uh, or um, as Yosha Bak would claim, it's a dream world, you know, and these are contemporary thinkers. So um, essentially, we are not accessible to this physical material world. So everyone's having this subjective conscious experience, um, but, it is but it is our own construction of the world. So let's say if I'm sitting here and there's this object here, right? Um, so I'm perceiving this object, but it is my imagination, which is you know, re renditioning this image. Uh, so maybe this is, you know, this object is not what it looks like, but it is my imagination which is constructing, you know, this. Oh, I think the best way to think about that is when you say what it looks like, mm -hmm. it, that, that thing having an appearance exactly. is another way of saying you're having some memories of it. Hmm. Interesting. You know, like you're talking about the appearance depends on you're having some memories of it. Your mind has to, the way can't says organize these this data in terms of space and time even though that data isn't necessarily on its own terms mm. in terms of space and time it's also not on its own terms data you know we can say it's a physical world outside of ourselves but why, what does it add to say it's a physical world you know you might say it's a geometry and that is like a presumes less than, than saying it's a physical world. And mm -hmm. then physicality is a story that we tell about it. But mm -hmm. like, I mean, the world that physics gives us reason to believe in, at the very least, seems to have properties of a four-dimensional space-time without separated space and time, and simultaneously an n-dimensional Hilbert space with an extremely high n. And in the, and the first rule of the Hilbert space is you can't talk about the Hilbert space because there's this thing, the quantum no-cloning theorem, that mm -hmm. says that any um, given, uh, any given wave function can't actually be reproduced. So it's only when you take a finite, separated, like divided relationship to a wave function and characterize it not as the enormously information rich or really quantum information risk thing that rich thing that the wave function is, but a story about a particle observation space and time, that you have a memory. Like, I mean, like you could say things are what memories look like from the inside. You know, when I 
see a glass of water, I am remembering a glass of water. And one of the consequences of that is that I can talk about it. And I can draw another glass of water, or I can imagine that glass of water without needing the original glass of water, which requires that there be a copy. But in like the real universe of like the Hilbert space, before we get into general relativity, you can't have copies. Mm-hmm. So that um, I don't quite feel like I don't feel like I fully understand this, but I don't feel like I would get anywhere by studying philosophy. I feel like I would get much farther by studying like Dieter Zer, interpretations of quantum mechanics, than I would by studying like philosophy. No, 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 that's completely uh, that's completely a good way of going about it for sure. Um, you know, a lot of uh, work has been done within the school of phenomenology is that they take uh, all of these thinkers. So not only let's say Husserl and Heidegger and Sartre and you know all of these philosophers, but also Francisco Varela and Humberto Maturana, who were neurophenomenologists, and their main thing was embodied cognition. So they also you know tried to uh, formulate a theory of perception. Uh, and so some work has been done by University of Sussex with the Anil Sage's team, is that where they're taking psychologists philosophers, neuroscientists, computational people all together to try to understand what perception is. And his uh, kind of thesis is that uh, we're constantly hallucinating our reality. So, you know, the hence the distinction between the physical material reality and then our entire subjective um, experience. Could we just say we're constantly remembering our reality? Like, what good does yeah. it do to say that we're hallucinating? How... Like certainly our memories are influenced by reality and certainly our memories are influenced by our preconceptions. No one expects our memories to be perfectly reliable or perfectly available at hand, but they're what we've got. They're the only basis we have for having any expectation of there being a reality external to them. You know, um, I think that's just like, turning questions of being and metaphysics into questions of um, epistemology and memory usually gets you as far towards the solutions as it's possible to get, I think. I don't think it's a coincidence that in the mythic, in the Greek mythological structure, Athena, Metis, wisdom of hand, like technical hands wisdom comes from like patriarchal power, eating memory and wisdom erupting from its head. You know, I think that the, um, there is a ongoing dynamic whereby like patriarchal power tries to invalidate the episodic memory structures that create symbols and causality and boundaries and tries to assert that skill, techne, perception, imminent phenomena or consciousness has all of the power that the more hippocampal sort of memory actually has. Mm-hmm. By the way, also one of his uh, thesis was that our brains are predictive machines. And he kind of, you know, takes uh, the Bayesian uh, model to construct this theory. And um, I think you're a Bayesian abo- abo- uh, abolitionist. Sorry for my mispronunciation. Um, I saw that on your um, description. So, yeah, you know, no, I'm, uh, Bayesianism is great. I'm very pro it as an epistemology. I feel like we want to distinguish between a sort of Aristotelian propositional Bayesianism, where something like the Wittgenstein, the world is all that that is the case, is acted on through the logic of Bayes' rule. So. In that schema, you 
that that's a sort of abstract philosophical way of thinking about things that you wouldn't actually build a computer with, but which um, treats propositions as more primary than computer science could ever get away with treating propositions as. And it, it seems to be true insofar as propositions are even a valid sort of thing. You can apply Bayes' rule to propositions and change the probabilities associated with propositions insofar as probability is a valid thing. But then the sorts of Bayesianism that we do in order to build an AI, those are multi-level hierarchical models of action, classification and action. So there's no, um, the AIs that make different decisions in a game have probably, evidence comes in that shifts the probabilities about what things should be done rather than evidence shifting the probabilities of how things are. And mm -hmm. like, we haven't gotten very far in the philosophy and AI space to, towards relating the question of how are things with the question of what, what should be done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Also, um, you know, talking about AI, um, what do you think of uh, super intelligence uh, from Nick Bostrom's uh, conceptualization. Like now, right now we're at deep narrow AI. We're about to hopefully go to AGI, and then maybe in the future the, there will be an ASI, um, and and you know this entire thing. So uh, I was wondering uh, now if we if we ever reach AGI in the you know next few years, what would be the time frame, if anything, of reaching this? artificial superintelligence. Or is that just like a okay. futuristic concept? Okay. So I've been talking to Bostrom about this stuff for about 20 years. And I feel like a fair amount of the stuff that was in superintelligence, we were all talking about, you know, back when, you know, we were all postdocs or whatever, or grad students or whatever. I, um, I, where to start? We are not near to AGI in the sense that Bostrom would have talked about AGI. Like in the sense that Bostrom is using the terms, AGI and superintelligence are approximately synonyms. Like there's not, in, in, in the Bostrom sense, there is not any meaningful probability of there ever existing an AGI that is not a superintelligence. Mm. You know, that, that he, he's, he's definitely not talking about AI, then AGI, then narrow AI, then AGI, then superintelligence. He's talking about narrow AI and then somewhat less narrow AI and then somewhat less narrow AI and then somewhat less narrow AI and then superintelligence. You know, but, um, but have you tracked Jaron Lanier, You Are Not a Gadget? Not yet, no. Okay. So Lanier says there are two ways to get superhuman AI. One is to make the machine smarter. The other is to make the people dumber. <laughs> so there is a long, long project of trying to make machines smarter. But the project of making people dumber is a much older project than the project of making machines smarter. <laughs> like we started by making wolves and coyotes smart, dumber we started on that at least a quarter million years ago, I believe. You mm -hmm. know, um, after we'd made the wolves and coyotes a lot dumber, we started making goats dumber, started <laughs> making sheep dumber, started making bulls and cats dumber. Eventually we got to making humans and horses dumber, you know, but we've yeah. been making humans dumber pretty aggressively for the last 5,000 years. You know, our early Neolithic ancestors or our late Paleolithic ancestors had quite a lot larger brains than we have. Mm -hmm. And probably even more larger olfactory lobes and things like that. Our olfactory lobes are particularly atrophied. Mm -hmm. So I expect our dopaminergic responses are very atrophied. So um, back then we had to do it slowly with selective breeding. Now we can do it faster with things like social media. So we can apply uh, narrow AI to the project of making people dumber. Um, mm -hmm. It seems to me that 
while we are nowhere close to having artificial general intelligence, we are fairly close to having mature idolatry. Mm. That is to say, we're fairly close to having the ability to contain humans in less than fully empowered mental states where the ability to investigate and nuance and distinctions is impaired. Oh yeah, now you're back. You were lagging a bit. It's Good. All okay. Yeah. Okay. So I see you. Yeah. Great. So sorry. Please I'm saying we, we are absolutely nowhere near being able to build a machine that can write war and peace. Mm -hmm. We are maybe two years away from being able to write a, build a machine that that can write Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> yeah. We are like not very far at all from being able to endorse a literary critical establishment that will endorse Fifty Shades of Grey as a greater masterpiece than War and Peace. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So like the open AI with its transformer networks demonstrated several years ago that a machine can write texts that the majority of humans, the majority of the time, are fooled by. Mm -hmm. And yet these texts are not very credible. If you approach them with the question of trying to distinguish between texts written by a machine and something coherent, mm -hmm. you can easily see that the texts written by a machine are not coherent. But if you approach them the way most people re uh, relate to most texts most of the time, that question of coherence isn't going to come up. True, sure. true. Sure. So like, I, I, think, I think that basically, if we could make a machine that could do like something like the whole range of human activities, this would have total transformative impact on the way we live our lives, on everything about the world, in the way that humans have a transformative impact on the world of bison and chimpanzees. Mm -hmm. But we don't need that to create the impression in humans that the machine has human type ability. We just need very cleverly created machines with very powerful computers behind them and very disoriented, confused humans drowning in a sea of information and, you know, drowning and, and like gaslit into doubting their own mind. So what do you think about like, you know, Elon Musk came up with this whole Tesla bot and he called it semi-sentient. Like, for me, it seems kind of like a marketing strategy because, like... Oh, yes, that's just marketing. That's just exactly, marketing. There's because nothing we can, going we, on we there. We cannot do sentience in a machine as of now. Like, I don't think that's possible. Yes, that's just marketing. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. No, because it really confused me. I was like, when I saw the thing, I was like, what? Like, are we already there? But then I was like, no, nah, that's not possible. No, we are not all the way there, we're not close to being all the way there. But remember, Zeus passes the Turing test. Mm -hmm. Lightning flashing the clouds gets interpreted as a person. Mm -hmm. So if Zeus and Indra pass the Turing test, then the Tesla AI can too. You know, all sorts of things can pass the Turing test given the actual typical human condition, mm -hmm. that's very different from requiring that the thing be credibly a person. It just requires that the people making the judgment be disoriented. And since the judgments of people add up through a democratic mechanism into the justification for violence, re real people with their minds mostly intact can be compelled to commit violence by the confused, disoriented judgments of very large numbers of people with their minds very far from intent. And those can be controlled by machines that are not very credibly people.
what do you think about like um i would say uh you know this creative creation of new institutions because i feel like within academia uh and looking at you know what academia looks like at the moment we we need better institutions at least from my opinion um either in terms of research or you know just you know basic academic structure and how universities work um and stuff like that so it seems like there is a sort of standard set of human institutions that people nat- naturally emerge out of a bunch of people and it seems like there is a different standard set of institutions that emerge out of a larger group of people like there's a set of institutions that you associate with like a clan or a small tribe and a set of institutions that you associate with like a chiefdom a large tribe with like developed differentiated shaman and chieftain type roles like um the, the the anthropologists back when the world was largely unexplored saw a lot of societies that fit into different reasonably well defined stages or different levels of development they might be for they might actually not be sequential but more and less complex societies uh, and um i think that the a critical thing that we can be pretty sure of now that was pretty uncertain 100 years ago is that the more developed more complex societies are higher in a trophic order than the less developed less complex societies but lower in efficiency and intelligence that the um sort of that complex societies work by preying on less complex societies that the more elaborate integrated priestly and aristocratic orders of a high neolithic civilization are only sustainably possible when surrounded by subjugated peoples or low neolithic systems or some other system that is um a trophic a pri- I talk about the primary producers primary consumers and secondary consumers of the spiritual ecosystem of the information ecosystem so like a so institutionally the america the european colonization of the really important to world history because it gave a bunch of people who had certain tools coming from the upper classes and a lot more tools coming from the unassimilated middle classes of a complex society a relative tabula rasa on which they could build a giant simple society mm-hmm. so in the western tradition democracy had always been an epithet it had always been a bad word it you know democracy is the worst thing to plato it's a very bad thing to aristotle it's not quite the worst thing tyranny is the worst thing but it's a bad thing um and it's only when you actually have a chance to escape from the complex societies that you get a chance to see what a simple society done at scale looks like mm-hmm. so um it turns out that simple societies done at scale are way 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 more productive than complex societies possibly more ecologically destructive um possibly not more racist but less compassionately racist <laughs> like more okay with extreme brutality against their uh, expropriated groups it's not like everyone doesn't have expropriated groups but that the type the less mitigating less mitigation of that um possibly less sustainable but the main thing is not any of those things the main thing is that the 
simple society done at scale is incredibly vulnerable to subversion by complex society. Mm. So like once America became by far the most powerful thing that had ever existed, it was child's play for European and eventually Indian arist aristocracies to subvert the American aristocracies and turn, uh, turn America into the sort of complex society that its founders had escaped from. <laughs> and now we have this guy coming from South Africa to build maybe a new simple society on Mars. And <laughs> perhaps in not very many years, the whole cycle can repeat itself. But like, I don't know, Grimes will be there from the beginning. So it might not take very long for things to get subverted. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> No, the Mars Let's project. Let's delete that out. Rhymes is great. <laughs> <laughs> very true, very true. So, I have two last questions for you. First, what are you, what are your favorite philosophers? And um, second, what is your vision with MetaMed Research and your institute itself? So, MetaMed was a long time ago, and it was largely about trying to see whether people with money and power could actually try to understand things. Okay, so my favorite philosophers, my guess is that Hume is basically the best place for most people to go for philosophy. Like Hume is not right about literally every. Okay, so Hume is probably the best. I think Spinoza is very, very good. Kant is very, very good. Rousseau maybe had the most impact of any philosopher and is like worth paying attention to. Mm -hmm. um, it's definitely worth reading The Republic. It's definitely worth reading some of Aristotle, but not that much. Like politics and metaphysics, I would say, not ethics. Um, I mean, what is what someone, who am I recommending it to? It's an obvious question. For most people today, I think Eliezer Yudkowsky is actually the place to start for trying to find their place in the world. Mm -hmm. And it's probably not a bad idea to follow that with Ayn Rand, who is like, you know, like you should start with things that are simple that stand on their own and you know um i don't know why are we why are we praising philosophers what are we trying to accomplish here <laughs> if we want to tell some kid who they should try to read it, it's got to depend on the kid mm -hmm. um To a really high degree, it seems to me that it's easy to see what Socrates and Plato were trying to do. Hmm. And it's easy to see that, the, that, that what they did didn't work. <laughs> but like, it really seems to me that if you were really clear on your demographic targeting, you could probably write a version of Plato's Republic that was a lot better than Plato's Republic for some specific demographic mm -hmm. and actually make something that works. It's incredible that Plato's Republic can potentially have any impact at all on people 2,500 years apart from a totally different language and whatever, but like, that's a lot to ask. It's really much better. It, it would be like, like it really seems like Plato's Republic for Buffy fans <laughs> would be a more promising thing to write. Or, or you, you see what I'm saying? It, it also be possible to do something like that. True, true. So going back to meta med research, um, so maybe because it cut out before, um, 
you know, what's your what's your vision and where do you want to take it? Okay, so decades ago, the Rand Corp did an investigation of how effective health insurance is at improving people's health outcomes. And the result was not at all. And a bunch of people have investigated that subsequently. And the result is usually not at all. It, this is, is, we have very strong reason to believe that we have a great deal of medical science that has been accumulated throughout the years that gives us real information about how to make our health better. And that if that information was applied correctly, it could make our health a lot better. But like basically all of our efforts to statistically aggregate how that information actually is used, leave us with the conclusion that all is illusion, that um, that research doesn't make us any better off in its actual implementation than if we just pretended it wasn't there and went with witch doctors. Mm. And it would be great if we had institutions that could actually follow their own rules well enough to make us better when we get sick. I want to see such institutions exist before I and those close to me get terribly sick. <laughs> no, but that's a really good version. So like, people have a great deal of difficulty in believing in concepts that are somewhat abstract when they are used to seeing people give the names of those concepts to things that are concrete and fake. Yeah. Like it, it's very difficult for people who it's very difficult. So like uh, three quarters of millennials and younger in America today say they believe in socialism. What does that mean? I mean, one way of thinking about this is their opinions are very different from the previous generation. Sure. But what are their opinions different about? Do they have a different opinion about socialism or do they have a different opinion about capitalism? And if they have a different opinion about capitalism, is it that they have a different opinion about whether capitalism is good or do they have a different opinion about what the word capitalism is pointing at? I think that it's fair to say that younger people think that the word capitalism has a different referent from the referent that older people think it has. And older people talk about a system where people produce goods and sell them in a market. But young people never encounter anything that looks remotely like the thing that older people are talking about. And they do encounter something that it, people tell them is capitalism. So they naturally say, yeah, that, I don't like it. <laughs> and they don't, it just, awkward, it's exhausting, it's futile to keep on saying, nope, that's not capitalism, that's not capitalism. You know, Siddhartha can say not this, not that, not this, not that for a while, but it isn't a usual, it, it, it's not the usual thing. The usual relationship to the senses and concepts that you're presented in is to accept your sense inputs as corresponding approximately to concepts, and that's good enough. That's very true. So basically, pretty much any effort that I'm engaged in is going to be at trying to build these sorts of naive versions of these sorts of institutions that, in fact, have been replaced by the sophisticated version. So a simple society, say Australian bush people in the on the Kalahari, not Kalahari, that's African bush people, either one, Australian Aboriginals uh, or African bush people in the Kalahari, either one 
would have no difficulty, as far as I can tell, in understanding a the type of court that Americans see on television. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but sophisticated people would have great difficulty. They would tend to think of that sort of court as a work of fiction, not corresponding to any real thing, as far as I can tell. Like most of our institutions are, I'll go further and say language itself assumed the, uh, not, ass Lacan is talking about a world of sophisticated institutions. Lacan is talking about a world where self has been destroyed and replaced by a different thing that calls itself language and that usually denies that the, that the original could exist. But if it's forced to refer to it, we'll refer to it as something like code. Hmm. The type of hospital that a Lacanian would believe a non-psychotic person could create could never be expected to make people better because it would only make people symbolically better. It would not make mm. them imaginarily better. And the imaginary is that which can be seen. True, true, yeah. So I would like to make imaginary hospitals rather than symbolic hospitals. I would like to make imaginary courts rather than symbolic courts. I would like to, I would like to build the institutions that the undamaged, e.g. in Lacanian terms, lacking an Oedipus complex, e.g. in Lacanian terms, psychotic people, mm -hmm. like all things that are described, all names are given by psychotic people. Mm -hmm. All, all codes, like, like the, the ostensible definition language schema, that's what Lacan is calling code. The ordinary language people, that's what he's calling language. Code always precedes language. Sure. Plans, descriptions, models, pictures, consciousness. These are all parts of code. The symbolic world is an unconscious world. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there is a distributed predator that takes con conscious concepts like hospitals and substitutes these nightmare dreams of hospitals like a AI, like an uh, AI image of created out of deep dreams. Like modern AIs can like draw pictures, but they don't know how anything fits together. So they can make a thing that like has a vibe. Like what I'm saying is that the hospitals that we have are like something that Deep Dream would create out of a description of how a hospital should be. <laughs> but like, I would like to create something that a human would create instead of Deep Dream. Yeah. True, true, true. Very true. Um, yeah, no, Lacan is very significant. I mean, there's two books that, um, actually there's one book that's come out, which is a psychoanalysis of artificial intelligence. And I think it's by um, Isabel Miller. And it draws a lot of Lacanian theory into computation. She tries to draw mm. a parallel there. And then there's, I think, another paper by- I will Google MIT the Press. psychoanalysis of artificial intelligence. That's interesting. Oh, no, I will, I will uh, forward you the PDF of the book. It's, it's really interesting um, because, you know, of, of uh, his graph of desire and, and all of the, his other graphs with mathemati mathematization of all of his graphs, his, uh, his theories into graphs. Um, it's, it's very compellingly interesting. And so a lot of people are now drawing parallels between Lacanian theory and AI and trying to kind of like find 
deeper meaning of the unconscious. You know how Lacan used to say that the unconscious is structured like language. So maybe, you know, using NLP or something like that, we could, you know, use and understand the unconscious to a very deeper level by examining human behavior. So it's something like a, a, what I would call a reactionary effect. It's like when you take A and B and you start- Yeah, I guess my, my intuition is that, my intuition is that much more useful than that is to use the use AI to understand the unconscious so that we can cancel out, compensate for the unconscious in everyday life. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Like, very specifically, we don't have an artificial version of conscious intelligence, but we do have an artificial version of unconscious intelligence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, insofar as our, the artificial version of unconscious intelligence, which we can build, mm -hmm. is able to verify our behavior as normal, mm our behavior can be certified as unconscious and sure. therefore meaningless, without reference, without moral weight. Mm -hmm. Like insofar as, uh, I think this is, my, this is my primary project at this point, is mm -hmm. that I think that we should be building machines that can watch our behavior and mm -hmm. basically tell us I could do that mm -hmm. when, it, when they could do that so that our attention doesn't get diverted by the things that machines could do. And we can focus on the things that machines can't do. Hmm. And that's quite a compelling project. Like, um, uh, see, that's the thing. Like, uh, you know, there's this thing called reactionary effect that I've kind of formulated. It's like when you take two variables, let's like, say two subjects, and by the word you if you know, studying, let's say, variable A and variable B, uh, and then you know kind of connecting it together you get to know more about the variable a by understanding variable b and you know you get to know about variable b by understanding variable a so if we if we were to take let's say the lacanian theory and computation you know just by studying both of them and interconnecting both of them you might actually get to know more about the unconscious both in the human aspects and both you know in the artificial unconscious aspect so i think that could you know, that could be really, really beneficial. So, you know, that could draw a really good parallel there. I agree. Now, it's really hard to learn about things like computation once you've learned about things like Lacanian theory, unfortunately. Unfortunately, true. It's a hard project. <laughs> you just need to get the order right. You need to learn the imaginary stuff before you learn the symbolic stuff. Yes, correct. Correct. Very correct. Anyway, um, I feel like we're, we've been on for a while. This is a pretty long podcast. But thank you so much for coming on um, and having this dialogue. Really enjoyed it. Uh, your ideas are absolutely brilliant. So, you know, it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Has been good. I will keep in touch. And I hope that, I hope we can create new institutions that are more fun to watch, more interesting, you know, build more than the institutions we're coming away from. Yeah, very true. Let's hope that. Um, so yeah, thank you, thank you so much. Bye. Bye, Sandra.